Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our Speaking to Competencies Rather Than Scales webinar. My name is Karen Gonzalez, and I'm the Product Marketing Manager here at CPP, as well as a moderator for today's webinar. I'm really happy to have you join us. I'd like to start with a few quick logistics. The webinar today will run for approximately 40 to 45 minutes. During the presentation, if you experience any issues, we have another member of our team, Melissa Young, available to help. Please submit any questions or concerns using the question function in the webinar controls. Now, I do want to mention that we are, we have a pretty stormy weather today, and um, we have been having a few small technical glitches, so I just want to make sure that everyone knows that we are recording this webinar, and if there are any problems that you experience, uh, whether on our end or your end, we will send out the recording to you. And we also plan to send out the presentation slides by next week. Um, so yeah, anyway, I just wanted to make that, that quick note about that. Um, if our presenter ends up not being able to advance slides, um, we've gotten taken care of and, you know, we will take care of that on our end. So now I'd like to welcome our presenter, Rob Devine. Rob is a senior consultant who focuses on management effectiveness training, team building, executive coaching, and executive selection. He is the author of the CPI 260 Certification Program and the CPI 260 Client Feedback Report Guide for Interpretation, as well as participant assessments, computer web-based reports, and facilitation guides. Rob is CPP's CPI 260 Certification Trainer, and he holds an MA in Industrial and Organizational Behavior from Golden Gate University and a BA in Sociology and Psychology from the University of Toronto. So please join me in welcoming Rob, and now I'd like to turn over the webinar to him. Welcome, Rob. Thanks very much, Karen. Really appreciate all the work that you put in into setting this whole thing up. I'm always amazed at the technology when it works. <laughs> I'm just amazed <laughs> that, you, that you can jam so many people uh, into my small office here. Uh, so <laughs> thank you for all of that. Uh, so hello, ho hello, everyone, and thanks for joining me today. Uh, and special greetings to any of you who have attended any of our CPI 260 certification workshops held across the U.S. Now, this is a two and a half day program that focuses on using this, an instrument called the CPI 260 and using it in consulting work to organizations. So if there are any attendees from those sessions uh, listening today, you might recognize an idea or two in today's session that was presented in those more in-depth meetings. So what will we cover today? That's a great lead into it. Let's get right to it. Uh, and what do I plan to share with you today? Well, first, I want to explain today's webinar title, Speaking to Competencies Rather Than to Scales. It's a simple idea, really, advancing your focus from specific assessment scale results to possible consequences of the results with regards to concepts of importance to the sponsoring organization. I'll show you what I mean about this in just a few minutes. But besides explaining that, I also want to share a, a sample generic competency model that I use, and I use it if my host organization hasn't already settled on a competency model. And finally, I want to show you a sample case so that, see, so that you see what I mean by speaking to competencies rather than scale. Now, you can apply this idea today to any formal assessment that you use in your consulting work, but today I'll focus on an assessment called the CPI 260. And if you're unfamiliar with the CPI, no worries. It's a powerful tool with its numerous scales. It'll be a good assessment for us to use today to demonstrate how all of this works. OK? So what do I mean by assessments? Well, there are lots of these things out there. And each one of them does a specific job in its own way. You can see I've got some listed, uh, not the formal names, but the types of assessments. Uh, on the screen right now, saying, what do I mean by assessments? There are aptitude and critical thinking measures, and I use these to understand how my client solves problems and how they handle data in order to make decisions. These are really important aspects of executive work, and I want to comment on them. The uh, work simulations and role plays, they give my client an opportunity to actually demonstrate how they recognize issues, how they handle information, how they prioritize, and how they think strategically. The structured interview gives your client an opportunity to articulate what they've experienced in their work life. And the structured interview gives you an opportunity to evaluate how they communicate this. The problem, though, I've discovered is that interviews are notoriously deceptive, and they're actually pretty difficult to administer. 
uh, multi-rater uh, CDs, uh, multi-raters and 360s, pardon me, they can be useful too if certain conditions are met and of course if they're well designed and if they're thoughtfully administered. And the personality inventories are useful too. I use these a lot. And I've listed four good ones here. All of them happen to be from CPC, but there are lots of them out there. But personality results are a great place for me to start in proposing my clients' strengths and style. That's really what I want to do for them. And against that context of strength and style, I also want to suggest possible blind spots. So I'm going to advance the slide to say, why do I use an assessment battery? Well, recent research indicates that using assessments in tandem incrementally increases the accuracy and the validity of your uh, descriptive process. And this is true for both strengths as well as possible limitations. Using more than one assessment device provides backup for me. That is, it allows me to look for patterns and trends across the various assessment data. It also uncovers inconsistencies in the data, which allows you to explore these unique uh, complexities of your client. The structure and standardization point there on the slide refers to bringing data to what could be, without assessment, a purely intuitive exercise. So I'm advancing this slide now to show what do I mean by scales, just in case that's never come up in your discussion. So in my definition, a scale is a group or cluster of items that are pointed in a, at a particular concept or construct. You can see I've got some examples of scales there on the slide. The MBTI step one, for example, well, that assessment has 93 forced choice items. And 21 of those 93 items are on the extroversion, introversion scale. And this gives the respondent 21 opportunities to reveal where they get their energy. Do they get it out there in the world of people in action? That is extroversion. Or do they get it in here, and I'm tapping my chest, in the world of thought and reflection? In other words, from the world of introversion. So the MBTI step one famously gives us a four letter type. The MBTI Step 2 has scales too, even more than Step 1. It provides further information beyond the four-letter type information that I talked about above. It provides 20 subscales. They call them facet scales, with five facets per each main MBTI scale. So each of those facet scales also has between six and nine items. I've shown FIRO B there towards the bottom of the slide, and if you know that one, it has six scales. And each one of those scales has nine items to a total of 54 items on that instrument. And then finally, the CPI 260, it has 29 scales. And we'll glance at several of these in a few minutes. They have names like, you can see I've got the short forms there, DO is dominance, EM is empathy, flexibility, and sensitivity. So the CPI 260 scales generally have between 20 and 25 items each. So I'm going to advance the uh, slide here to show you an MBTI screenshot. It's a sample page from an MBTI report, and you can see the results for Jane's sample in each of the four main scales of the MBTI in the lower half of the page. You see those horizontal uh, line graphs? The length of the blue horizontal line shows the consistency with which Jane selected the items for one pole of the scale over the other. So that you can see, I hope you can see that slide, you can see that Jane was pretty consistent in picking extroversion, intuition, and perceiving the last one. The second to last, she seems to have split her vote on the 24 items that are on the TF scale. So let me advance this slide to show you a CPI page, just one of the pages from a client feedback report for the CPI 260. This page is showing seven of the, well, it, if you can see the, if you could see the whole thing, it would show seven of the 29 scales from the CPI, all having to do with interpersonal style. You can barely make out the names of the scale names here because they're miniaturized a little bit, but there you can see dominance, the first one, capacity for status, sociability, and it actually goes down so that the full page shows seven slides to the empathy scale. But from these report samples, perhaps you can see how tempting it would be 
to dive into interpreting and debriefing the numerous scales in the order that they appear presented in the reports. So my question to you is, what if you were to turn this around and pick the results that you're interested in and fit them into a competency model of relevance to the organization? So first of all, you'll find out that some organizations already have competency models. And if, they, if an organization that you're working with already has one, and the model is current and it's widely used by the organization, by all means, use that one to organize your interpretation in your feedback session. I'm showing a slide now that shows some existing sets of competencies that I've encountered. You can see the competencies are they're actually clusters of competencies. They're kind of themes, really. They're in different orders. They have different names. But they have similar topics. Organization A on the left, they were a retail fashion organization that I worked with. They wanted to emphasize innovation and cutting edge thinking, as well as risk taking, and also building a spree de corps on their teams. You can see there are six. Uh, Themes running down the left-hand side, results orientation, innovation, and so on. You can even see executional excellence. Really, that one referred to administrative duties and their ability to manage and, and monitor data. And uh, I'm not sure there is a, such a word in the dictionary as executional. I always got a red line in my Microsoft Word when I was writing reports for them, and I typed in executional excellence. But organization B on the right, had a little more emphasis on planning and executing. And they have a catch-all theme at the bottom they call personal characteristics. And it really contained notions that, such as tough-mindedness and willing to push for the company objective. So we consulted to these organizations, and we used job analysis to identify the relevant themes or factors for them. And then we let them work with them and change them as they saw fit. We also coerced those organizations into keeping things manageable. And that's why we ended up with about six themes. We used the competency themes to, for instance, to design and score work simulations that, for them. And we also designed interview protocols and scoring guides for the interview protocols so that their people could interview each other and find out about each other and then score the responses. So we use the uh, competencies to organize all that information. So let me go on to this. What if, you're, uh, if your sponsoring organization doesn't have a competency model, or as they may call them, some leadership behaviors or factors that they've developed? So here's a generic model that you can use in your work. And it just about covers all of the important and relevant bases for success at work. You can see again that we kept it to six. I've worked with some organizations that had up to 10 to 12 themes in their competency model, almost impossible to work with. So we tried to keep this brief and succinct. We wanted it to, wanted it to be clear and straightforward and comprehensive. And if you decide to use a model like this in reporting back, you can change the names and expand the definitions to include what the organization, your sponsoring organization, thinks is important. So let's take a look at them for a little. Managing self, you can see it's about self-awareness and adaptability. It's about personal attitude and worldview, really. I'll show you a little bit more detail in a minute. Thinking, thinking and deciding, how does your client go about solving problems, analyzing data, and making decisions? Getting things done? Motivation, achievement drive, as you see, I have it there. And, and it kind of answers the question, this theme does, answers the question, besides the money, what is it that the client looks for in their job? The managing work theme, or cluster of competencies, you can see it's about administration and planning. It's their approach to being orderly and tracking details and monitoring progress. And there's the working with people theme, the interpersonal piece. How do they relate and build relationships and connect to people? Do they tend to join in, or do they have a tendency to pull back? And finally, leading people about having impact and influence. 
So organizing your work around a model like this can be a real value add for both you, the consultant, and for your organization that you're consulting to. Speaking to these six, six themes helps you not leave anything of importance out in your work. And it allows you to focus on using a coach's voice as opposed to the voice of the assessment. The themes may help you to speak to issues that are germane to the work of the organization rather than to get mired in the scale results and the assessment philosophy. So let me advance the slide to why I use the CPI 260 assessment. I like its empirically derived scales. And what I mean by empirically derived is that the descriptions for being high or low on a scale actually come from somewhere rather than from a theory. So in feeding back CPI 260 results, I frequently find myself saying to my clients, you know, your scores in this area are similar to people who are described by others like this. And then I go on with the indication. So the purpose of the CPI is to describe you as if you were being described by an objective and knowledgeable set of others. And the descriptions are about, well, as I have it there on the slide, the descriptions that the CPI offers about interpersonal style and about ways of relating, about motivation and drive, about need for structure, an approach to the status quo, do they embrace it or do they want to shake things up, and about ways of leading. And here's a beautiful piece of the CPI. Besides being descriptive, it's also comparative. That is that there are norms. I can compare my clients' scores to large samples of other on-track managers and executives, and I can look for and interpret similarities and differences. And that's a big piece, one of the reasons that I like to use the CPI. So let's go back and take a look briefly at each of the six competency, competency themes in our generic model relative to some of the CPI 260 scales. So here's managing self. And remember, this theme is about self-awareness as well as about adaptability. You know, these themes, when I look at them, they remind me of emotional intelligence in the sense of recognizing and managing emotions in oneself. In the right-hand column, I've sampled a few CPI 260 scales, not all of them, but just a few. I didn't want to clutter up the slide too much because there are other CPI scales I can look at. But these scales in particular, the descriptive interpretations of each, they seem to shine a light on some aspect of self-management. So those first three CPI 260 scales in the rightmost column in the top panel, well-being, self-acceptance, good impression. They pose descriptions for high scores and low scores that seem related to the concept of self-confidence. You can imagine that people with high well-being and high self-acceptance do come across as self-confident to others. And you want the high, but not too high, good impression. Again, showing self-confidence. Lower scores on well-being and self-acceptance and higher good impression, well, that suggests something different. It's certainly not self-confidence. But similarly, in the second panel, the CPI 260 scale scores for self-control, flexibility, tolerance, and, and creative temperament. They present interpretive proposals, depending on the scale scores, of course, for how flexible, adaptable, open-minded, and willing to experiment a person is. So the facet here attached to sort of openness to change versus closed Again, in the last, of the, two, the last of the two facets I have for managing self, dealing with stress and optimism and pessimism, I've identified some CPI 260 scales that seem related. The high scores on well-being and satisfaction, they tend to be described by others as positive, upbeat, having good morale. In other words, they seem to have it together. And that's one of the concepts that managing self tries to tap. So I look at all of these scale scores to my client, and I make proposals about what they mean relative to the theme of competency for managing self. Does that make sense? Let's take a look at another theme. So here's thinking and deciding. Remember, thinking and deciding is about problem solving and decision making. I want to be able to describe how they do that. Again, I've got four facets for the thinking and deciding. 
and I'm using different CPI 260 scales this time, arrayed for each of the facets. The dominance, independence, and self-control scores tell me if my client is cautious and tentative in decision making, or perhaps more restless and quick to decide and quick to act. In the second panel there, tolerance, independence, again, and good impression, those scales indicate how likely it is that my client involves others and seeks their ideas in decision making, or whether they more prefer to decide by going it alone. The flexibility and create, creative temperament scale results in the bottom panel indicate how creative and innovative my client is in decision making versus taking a more traditional and a more let's go with the tried and true approach. So you're getting the idea of how all of this works. I've got these themes, I have these facets, and I have tried to apply CPI 260 scales to each one. Now how do I establish all of these? Well, the six themes are basically a distillation of solid competency models out there and that we found in the literature. So then I arrayed those six and I looked up interpretive proposals for each CPI 260 scale. Remember that many CPI 260 scales are empirically derived. In other words, low scores on a scale like sociability are generally described by others as quiet and shy, while high scores have trouble keeping quiet. So I picked CPI scales whose interpretive indications linked to a competency team, and I added them to my list to consult when I'm assembling my interpretive reports. So let's go to getting things done. Recall this is about motivation and achievement drive. Again, you can see four facets on the left side of the screen with some CPI 260 scales arrayed for each. This theme gets at the question, what's necessary in a job and work environment that will help me thrive? Is it getting things accomplished with others? Or is it showing what you can do in order to see results by yourself? Do you prefer a highly structured work environment with policies, rules, and regulations all in place? Or do you prefer a more spontaneous, let's see what's needed approach? How about profile? Do you like whole pro high profile? Do you want to be noticed? Or more comfortable with a behind the scenes role? Leading by example. All of these ideas relate in some way to motivation and achievement drive. So let's go on to managing work. The next slide. Remember, managing work is about administrative style and ability to be a bureaucrat. <laughs> Does this person design, develop, and implement systems for tracking details and monitoring progress? Or will they likely rely on others to do that? I show just a couple of facets for this theme and just three CPI 260 scales. So I often pair the CPI scales with results from my interview information and the work simulation performance, if I have that, in order to comment on this theme. And now the working with people theme. Remember, it's about interpersonal characteristics. How does this person get along and then deal with others? Are they a people person, or are they more self-contained? What kind of contributions will they make to team life? Are they task-oriented or people-oriented? Interestingly, in my work in organizations, some people believe that this is the key facet. And I agree that it is important. But it is, in this competency model, just one of the themes. We need to look at all of the others, too. And finally, the sixth theme, the leadership competency theme. Is my client forceful, influential, and take charge? Or are they more benign, cooperative, and likely to offer the benefit of doubt to others? How will they perform in holding others accountable? Or when standards are not being kept up, will they be willing to confront? So I'm showing four important leadership facets and several CPI 260 scales. There are actually more CPI scales that we could look at, but I just didn't want to clutter up the slide. But you get the gist 
of how I applied sl uh, scale, TPI 260 scale, to facets and to the theme of leading people. And so, with my six themes ready to go, and an idea of which CPI 260 scales to look at, I'm ready to begin assembling my thoughts in a report. So here's a page for, for my client, John Sample, from his CPI 260 report. Now, if you look closely at the slide, you can see there are seven scales presented, and they all have to do with interpersonal style. You can see the, the heading there for dealing with others. You can see John's scores indicated by the small blue triangle markers, and then there is an actual numerical score beside each scale name. Those little red hash marks that you can see, I added those by hand. That's the range of scores that I got from the norms around the organizational norms of the CPI. There are the range of scores that I was expecting for on-track managers. Remember before I said that the CPI 260 was descriptive and comparative? So those red hash marks allow me to compare. Hmm, take a look at that first scale, dominance. The score is 53, but I was expecting scores from about 57 to 65, but he's about five points lower or so in the direction of being non-assertive. That would worry me as I'm starting to feel a developmental opportunity coming on for John. Wow, take a look at his sociability score. Third scale down, 44. You can see there's a delta there of minus 11 I've pinned in. Yeah, that is 11 points lower in the direction of not outgoing than I was expecting. Ouch! Look at the final scale, empathy. You got a score of 51. I was expecting 60 to 63. Hmm, he doesn't read people well. So you can see, as a, I'm thinking out loud here, I'm getting some ideas about his comfort with people, how he relates to them, and along with that lower dominant score, how he wields authority and power and how he leads people. So I'm getting ideas about his strengths and style, as well as some potential developmental opportunities. And I've got 22 more CPI scales that I could consider. The first thing to do is I assemble a brief summary report of interpretive statements derived from John's CPI 260 scale results. My report just has six subheadings, like the ones on the left side of the generic model, one for each competency theme. And I write the statements from the perspective of the particular theme. And I can usually do that report in one to two single pages. So you can see that instead of talking to CPI scales, I talk to those themes of managing self, thinking and deciding, and leading people. In other words, what do your CPI results say about how you manage self, how you make decisions, how you, uh, what motivates you, how you organize things, how you relate, and how you lead? And then I summarize likely strengths and developmental opportunities for John based on his scale scores, and again, arranged by theme. And with regard to these, here they are for working with people. This is strength number one for John. You can see, I've noted that he can be, is that a little bubble there? Okay, he can engage others when required and be spontaneous, but more often than not, he's low key and deliberate. He keeps some distance between himself, hard to get to know. Do you remember his lower sociability scores from a few pages back, a few slides back, and his empathy scores? There were some other 60 scales that we didn't discuss that suggested the independent and individualist, individualistic piece. So notice that this theme is listed by me as mostly a strength, but my cautious wording sets up the possibility in some circumstances of his interpersonal style being a possible developmental opportunity for him, depending on what his career aspirations are. So that's his first strength that I called out for him, is how he relates, even though he's got some work to do. Here's the second one. Oops. Managing work. A 
again, this is mostly a strength in his approach to managing work. He responds to objecti objectives and outcomes, but he does this in his own unique way. The final point on this slide sets up the opportunity for me in my debrief with him to suggest that he's perhaps a better manager and developer of products and things than he is of people. And he Rob? Yes. Rob, I'm sorry to interrupt, but your slide didn't seem to advance. You're on, on the 22, right? I am on slide 22, yes, showing managing work. OK, there you go. You're there. Thank you. OK, thanks, Karen. So let me just kind of repeat that. So here's his second proposed strength for John. It's around the theme of managing work. And you can see that I've, uh, uh, again, I've got some cautious wording. He likes objectives and expected outcomes clearly indicated, but he does things on his own unique terms. And the final point on this slide is an opportunity for me in my debrief with him to suggest that he's a better manager and developer of things and products than he is of people. And he acknowledged some of that. I'm going to advance the slide now onto leadership the leading people piece. You can see I called it perspectives on leading. Various of his CPI 260 results suggest that he can lead in his unique business area when required to do so. He tends to use his subject matter expertise to cement his authority, and I had discovered that in the interview. But he wants to be able to say when he's leading something, I did it my way, and when we spoke, I discussed with him the possibility of him being perceived by some as not fully committed. Well, he was surprised by that because he thought he was just being busy and quiet and innovative, and he never stopped to think how his style could be perceived by others that needed something different. So then his fourth strength, openness to change, you can see on the top of this new slide, it reflects his comfort with change. And this was a real area of strength for him. It was important to this engineering, engineering organization also. So I pulled this theme, openness to change, out of the managing self theme that you might recall where you saw it before. There were several CPI 260 scales devoted to this. And all of John's scores indicated that he was open to change and that this was a major contribution that he liked to make. He was a voice for change. So this turned out to be the real strength for him. So against this context of John's strengths and style, now for a developmental opportunity or two. Here's the first one. I've just changed the slide. It shows proposed CFR developmental opportunity. That CFR means client feedback report for the CPI 260. The first one that I came up, one, came up with has to be the interpersonal piece that we discussed a little bit earlier. He needs to be more attentive to people. Take a look at the third point that I've got there, of being a more involved student of people. I think that might help him convince others to work with him and to get behind his ideas. And basically, as I discussed with him, he needs to know when to dial up his interpersonal involvement and show his interest in some ways. In some ways, he kind of would increase his own anxiety at first doing this because he's not used to it, but he would have the effect of lowering the anxiety of others if he could attend to this. And then the second developmental opportunity I had for him was to be more constructively assertive. You may recall from a few slides back his relatively lower dominant scores, as well as the affirmation somewhat limited way of dealing with others. So I put those first two points in to kind of tap into these. Point number three about conflict handling was a conjecture on my part. Because we'd not used CPP's TKI assessment that deals with conflict handling modes. But in discussion with him, John acknowledged that his go-to approach to dealing with conflict was to avoid it. So we set up a separate program for him to improve his conflict handling style. And this required him to address his first two developmental opportunities here of being a better student of people and knowing when to be constructively assertive. So there you have it. 
I hope this brief introduction was of use to you and that it sparked a few ideas in you. My point again, using a competency model like the one that I shared with you might just enable you to speak to your client and your client organization in terms that matter to them and that are clearly heard. Thanks very much. Thanks, Rob. And it looks like you may need to advance one more slide. Yes. OK. And, oh, perfect. Thank you. Great. That was fantastic. Thank you, Rob. Um, you know, I have a, a quick question. So if you don't mind, I noticed, um, and someone asked us on slide 14, where you have the facet that's flexibility, but that one doesn't tie into the flexibility scale. Um, so I just had a question as to why that, that those two don't tie together. Uh, actually, uh, for um, thinking and deciding for flexibility, um, mm -hmm. um, I, that I just put in the social presence scale, but flexibility scale is also in there. I just don't have it on the slide. Oh, perfect. Okay, thank you for clarifying. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's a good point. Yes. Like thank I said, I, I, was, I was trying to keep the slides uh, reasonably clean and easy to follow. Yeah. Great, thank you. I just thought that was a good question. I thought that was a good yeah, it is. good catch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. yeah, great. Well, thank you everyone uh, for joining us. We really appreciate it. Uh, for myself, uh, the CPI 260 is a really powerful tool. It's something that I have personally used in my own development, uh, growing here at CPP in my role. Uh, so I think it's something that um, is just powerful. And, and you know, Rob gave us just a just a taste of what the CPI can do and how it can help. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, we will be sending you an email with the link to the recording and the slides, and we also will be sending you a short series of emails to learn a little more about the CPI 260 and how it can help in your organization. If it's something that, that may be of interest to you, um, just get a little more information on that. So again, I want to thank everyone for taking the time to attend our webinar today. And Rob, thank you very much for sharing your knowledge and your expertise with us today. It, it was great. Thank you very much. Thank you. We enjoyed doing it. Thank you. <laughs> well, everyone, I hope you have a wonderful day. Goodbye. Bye-bye.